relationship. He absolutely loves it. He is a vampire at heart. We thank you, Colonel Kirk. Kirk Schlichter, take it away. Thank you, Hugh Hewitt. I am Kirk Schlichter, senior columnist at townhall.com, noted Los Angeles trial lawyer. I am a retired United States Army colonel. I am the author of the forthcoming Regnery book, We'll Be Back, The Fall and Rise of America, which you must pre-order unless you want to die unloved and alone. Hugh missed it by that much. That's right. Hugh missed the glorious opening of freedom yesterday, which spread across the land thanks to 35-year-old Judge Catherine Kimball Mizell of the Middle District of Florida, whose administrative law ruling on the mask mandate found that the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, had no authority to make such a command. Liberals are melting down at her nationwide injunction against this fascist order to throw a gag around your face on an airplane. Oh, it's beautiful. But what's more beautiful, besides the awakening of freedom, of facial liberty on aircraft and in airports. What's glorious is the liberal meltdown about it. Twitter blue checks are in a tizzy because now you don't have to walk around with an obedience gag around your pie hole. I love their tears, ladies and gentlemen. I, I wish to bathe in them. I wish to float on them. Oh, I, I'm just I'm I'm just so happy now. Now this is this is absolutely uh, uh, perfect ruling. Okay, look, I, I I am a as I said a noted Los Angeles trial lawyer. I deal with federal judges uh, on a fairly re, uh, frequent basis, and uh, I, I I know how to read an opinion. This opinion was pretty darn good. Uh, the law which the CDC cited for its declaration that you have to uh, uh, stick a useless piece of paper around your face uh, to get on an aircraft basically did not provide any kind of authority to Center for Disease Control to actually make this decree. You know, it has control over sanitation, according to the law, 1944 law. Putting a mask on your face is not sanitation in any sense of the word. Now, there were some other bases for this, including administrative rulemaking uh, uh, problems. But, you know, after two years of this nonsense, and it's always been nonsense, There's there are a few places that you are more objectively safe than on an airplane with its filters and such. Uh, but, a, but after two years of this nonsense, it goes to this judge. Now, she's a 35-year-old judge, okay? But she's pretty darn accomplished. She's been a uh, clerk for four federal judges, including Judge Clarence Thomas. And, of course, the liberals are melting down about this, all right? But it gets better, folks. She's appointed by Donald Trump. She is uh, confirmed in the lame duck session in 2020 to the Middle District of Florida. And uh, she issues this nationwide injunction. Now, the liberals have been loving their nationwide injunctions. You remember the Florida judge. Or not the Florida judge. The Hawaii judge. Right? Whenever they have a problem with some federal law or action that, uh, a federal, you know, thing that Donald Trump was doing, they go find some Hawaiian judge to issue a nationwide injunction. This is the most important, uh, you know, glorious thing that could ever happen. Well, welcome to the Florida judge. Now we got Florida judge. And uh, they are melting. How can one judge do this? Yeah, how can she? New rules, baby. New rules. Oh, drink it in. I'm drinking it in. I'm drinking it in. And I think we have a future Supreme Court justice in Judge Mizell. I, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Look, uh, look for when uh, the murder turtle is running the Senate next year, because he will be running the Senate next year, in my humble opinion. Uh, we'll check with David Drucker and... Uh, 
uh, Byron York a little later to see if they concur that the Republicans will take the Senate. We know they're taking the House. House is done. House is over. Just we're not even going to talk about that. Let's we're we're going to talk about the Senate. But you know when with with Mitch McConnell running the Senate and a Republican running things after 2024 because we know that's going to happen because the Democrats are just screwing up left and right and we're going to get to that in a sec. Um, I think we're going to see uh, Judge Mizell on the Circuit Court of Appeal. And I think someday she may well be on the Supreme Court, and I'd like to see her on it like age 40, so she can reign for 50 years of pain. Oh, oh I'm, getting all, I'm getting all tingly, folks. I'm getting all tingly at the thought of a conservative justice who doesn't hesitate to act. Now, I mentioned that the Democrats are screwing up, and, um, well, let's put it this way. Grandpa Badfinger, our crusty dust puppet of a president, is such a mess. He literally had to be rescued yesterday by the Easter Bunny. Well, it wasn't yesterday. It was a couple days ago. By the Easter Bunny. That's right. He made the mistake of like beginning a long, rambling soliloquy to the press at some Easter function. Some flunky in an Easter Bunny getup, you know, hops over, right? And he's like, come on, Mr. President, got to go. Look, President Beavis is a mess. And and look, Hugh Hewitt, who is a very nice guy, he's a genuinely nice human being, and he phrases it as uh, the president is infirm. Yeah, that's one way of putting it. That's like saying a Ferrari is fast. Homeboy is a mess. I mean, he's literally being rescued from talking to the press by the Easter Bunny. Now, that's, I mean, coming on the heels of him shaking air with an, uh, shaking hands with an invisible friend. There's there's nobody in charge. Now, Democrats uh, are trying to fill the void. Uh, Chris Coons, who uh, uh, Hugh, uh, Hugh finds one of the less repellent Democrats, he's another uh, Delaware guy like, uh, uh, you know, President Krusty. Yeah, uh, on Sunday he goes on uh, one of the shows and he says, you know, Russians aren't going to stop unless we go in and stop them. So yesterday we had the big tap dancing, uh, uh, you know, da, 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 da. no, I, I didn't mean we'd use U.S. troops. I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. That's not what I'm saying. Dude, that was what you were saying. We, we, we heard you. You said it. Uh, this guy, these guys, they're a mess. Who's, who's going to rescue the Democrats? Who's going to rescue them from themselves? You know, right now. Democrat Senate candidates, uh, you know, incumbents particularly, like uh, the one in Nevada who's running against Adam Laxalt, who's going to win the primary there. Good friend of mine. Uh, worked uh, worked with him and Rick, uh, Rick Grinnell and Matt Schlapp and some other folks uh, fighting for election integrity after the election. Um, Cortez Masto, who, who I, I just saw a picture of her yesterday. She's like one of these anonymous bench warmers. You know, backbencher type. She's actually behind the backbench. She's on like a whole different set of benches that's somewhere off. She does literally nothing except obey uh, Schumer. She's like terrified that President Cressy's going to lift Title 42, which allows us basically summary removal of illegal aliens. If we don't do that, we're going to start getting 200,000 illegal aliens a month. Oh, wait a minute. We already have that. Imagine half a million illegal aliens every month. She knows the people of Nevada aren't going to like it. Mark Kelly's sitting there going, he can see the sweat glistening on his bald, gun-grabbing head. Democrats are going to get wiped out in the Rio Grande Valley. Oh, that was all blue. They're going to get slaughtered. And I am here for it, and you're here for it, here on the Hugh Hewitt Radio Program. I'm guest host Kurt Schlechter. we got three hours of insanity. Stick Around.
Uh, William Shatner's legendary spoken word performance of Elton John's Rocket Man, which uh, I think is uh, extremely apt right now because we're talking about Elon Musk. Again, I'm uh, guest host Kurt Schlichter sitting in for Hugh Hewitt, and uh, I'm known for being the author of the forthcoming book, We'll Be Back, The Fall and Rise of America, which you should pre-order, for being a noted uh, trial lawyer in Los Angeles, for being a retired Army colonel, for being the senior columnist at townhall.com. But I think my greatest role is as a Twitter shareholder, and I've been very, very concerned about the antics of the board. So I went and I got an expert to tell us about this area of law to explain what our rights are as shareholders in this fine, fine company. I grabbed my pal, Professor Todd Henderson, University of Chicago Law School, the Michael J. Marks Professor of Law, and a securities expert, Professor Henderson. Welcome to the Hugh Hewitt Radio Program. Colonel Schlichter, it's great to be here. Well, it is great to have you. Now, uh, I I am a uh, a regular old-school litigator. I know nothing of your fancy securities law. I took corporations in uh, uh, law school and promptly forgot about it as soon as I passed the California bar exam. Uh, Do I have any kind of rights? Because this board, uh, you know... I'm losing out about 500 bucks by them not taking this uh, generous $54.20 offer by uh, Elon Musk. I'm outraged, and more importantly, I'm impoverished. Do I have any rights as a shareholder of Twitter? Well, you use the word fancy securities law, and, and you know honestly, it's way too fancy and way too complex. And in general, I, my own view is it's way too protective of corporate managers. Um, it, it really started not just in the New Deal, but in 1968 when a very corrupt senator from New Jersey, this guy named Senator Williams, passed a law that made it very difficult for people like Elon Musk to take over other corporations. Um, all these obligations to have to disclose how much you have and what your plans are, um, you know, it's a little bit like uh, telling people who are trying to come in and save the kingdom they've got to disclose exactly what their war plans are before they do that. So the whole system is really rigged against people like Musk who are trying to take over companies to improve them. So, you know, that's a sort of starting position. Um, But unfortunately, under the rules as they are, from what I've seen from the public reports that's done is pretty squarely within what their legal rights are to do. Well, uh, what what they appear to have done, Professor Henderson, is... uh, uh, Elon Musk obtained about a little over 9% of the company's stock, and uh, he made an offer of $54.20 a share. Uh, it was trading at 48 yesterday. It was 45.08 on Friday. I, I, watch, I watch the stock market like a hawk. And, um, uh, you know, th- there's a premium there. There's, there. there's money on the table. I'm a shareholder. I, you know, silly me, I thought that the... Uh, uh, the board was supposed to act in shareholder interests. I don't understand how it's shareholders' interest to not get me the maximum value for my stock. Yeah, it's a good point. So, first, I mean, one thing that I think to appreciate is that it's not at all clear that Musk has made a serious offer. Um, just because he, you know, his filing with the SEC said he hasn't really lined up the financing yet. And he said he's going to make that offer. So I just want to note at the outset that it's not exactly clear what the offer on the table is. And I think the fact that the stock price is still trading, you know, in the 40s suggests that Wall Street really doesn't believe that he's serious about the offer. But let's let's take for a second that he is serious about the offer. Um, you're right that the board's job is to maximize shareholder value. And then the question is, what is the mechanism by which they can do that? The board adopted something called a poison pill, which it's complicated, but basically it just makes it impossible for Musk to take uh, ownership of the company without the board's approval. And if what that's designed to do is to get him to make a better offer, then they might be working in shareholders' interest. So if they say to him, look, we've taken this poison pill. If you try to take us over, we'll just bite on this pill and kill the whole company, dilute your shares and, and, and really prevent you from doing it. Um, it's a kind of, you know... And won't it dilute office. my shares, too? 
That, that, well, the way the poison pill works is that the, they only dilute the shares of the, of the person trying to take over the company. So it's this trick developed by these New York lawyers. It's basically the, you know, it's like in Dr. Strangelove. Uh, you know, it's the, uh, it's the bomb that happens that uh, sort of uh, kills everybody at the end, um, the doomsday bomb. And, and the idea is it never would be used. But it basically makes the board have incredible amounts of leverage for somebody who's trying to take over the company. So if the board did this and said to Musk, look, 54 isn't enough, we want to get 64, then that's something that would be actually in the shareholder's interest. You would prefer 64 to 54, I assume. I'm no ma- hey, look, I'm no mathematician. Just yeah. <laughs> like uh, uh, K- uh, KBJ was no biologist. But I think 64 is higher than 54. Yeah, so uh, if what the board does is use this leverage to get a better deal for shareholders, then you'd be in favor of that. If what they do is they use the, the leverage to push Musk away um, and keep the stock at $45, then I think shareholders would rightly be upset. They unfortunately, under the current law, pretty have pretty broad discretion to be able to do that. Now, what can you do as a shareholder? Well, you can sell your shares. You're going to get less than 54 right now. You're going to get 45 based on what you said. Um, you can also vote in the corporate elections to cut, get rid of these, this board and put in a board that would redeem the pill, get rid of this doomsday bomb that they have that would keep Musk away, uh, and get in directors who will actually serve what are the shareholders' interests. And I think, frankly, the reason we're all talking about this is it's not just the shareholders' interest. There's a public interest in returning Twitter to something that is more sensible about, you know, kick off Donald Trump, but keep on the Iranian mullahs, let the Chinese put all the propaganda they want out there and censor all sorts of domestic politicians. I mean, I think that's the real fundamental issue. And what Musk is trying to do is return it to being the free speech that it was intended to do. I think we should all be in favor of that. Unfortunately, the way corporate law works, the board has a lot of discretion when it comes to takeovers. Well, that you know, Professor Henderson, uh, that and, and that's the problem. Look, these guys want money as much as anybody else. However, what's more important to them is maintaining the power that comes with uh, controlling the public square, and the way they are controlling the public square in such a way as to ensure that counter narrative information is suppressed. Whether it's uh, banning Donald Trump or banning the libs of TikTok or banning uh, anybody else who rails against the regime, uh, th- this is not about shareholder value. This is about the ruling class maintaining its control of the narrative and its power, and we all know it. And it seems to me that, uh, uh, you know, it, per- perhaps the law doesn't allow a remedy, but boy, there ought to be a remedy. Do you expect to see uh, any kind of shareholder lawsuits over this? Well, I think the first thing to, to point out is that, uh, as you said, uh, this isn't really about shareholder value. Uh, Musk tweeted the other day the uh, compensation of the board of directors, and they hold very, very <laughs> few shares in yes. Twitter. Uh, and so they don't really, they're not aligned uh, with you because the, uh, the what true. the shareholders care about is turning their money into more money. And what the directors uh, prefer is their own cynicker there with their, their uh, four meetings a year and their fancy trips and the big compensation they get. And they're not really aligned with each other. So that's a problem, and Twitter should fix that. It's a problem in corporate America more generally. With respect to shareholder lawsuits, I doubt it based on what the current situation is. I'd love to see Musk make a more serious offer, line up the financing, uh, and make a play. He could also launch a proxy battle to try to replace the board of directors, throw the bums out, and replace them with new managers. He has a lot of power as the, as the largest shareholder, and I'd like to see him exercise that. Unfortunately, the way that corporate law is, again, since 1968, when this very pro-management, anti-shareholder, anti-activist shareholder, and since that law came in, it's much more difficult. And frankly, the Securities Exchange Commission is considering a variety of new rules designed to prevent corporate activism. And these activists, more generally, are the people who are pushing for changes in corporate America to break the stranglehold that boards have uh, and managers have, serving things like the climate agenda and all these other things as opposed to shareholder value. Activists are really pushing to have corporate America focus on what it's supposed to be focusing on, which is making money for shareholders. 
And the Gensler SEC is doing what it can to try to squash activism more generally. So I think this is just one example of a broader trend against shareholder rights which I think is distressing. Well, uh, Professor Henderson, uh, the Republicans look likely to take the House and the Senate back. In 2024, uh, with, uh, with a little luck, we'll take the presidency away from this uh, senile dust puppet masquerading as our chief executive. A- at that point, we will have the chance to uh, uh, do some legislation and get things back on track. What kind of, what kind of legal reforms would you look for uh, to address these problems, because frankly, I'm sick of corporate America being used as a vehicle for every commie, pinko, and leftist and their bizarre obsessions and fetishes. We got about 30 seconds. So I, I think uh, Senator Toomey just introduced some legislation. It was the Jobs Act 4.0, which contained a wide variety of pro capital markets regulation. I'd love to see the uh, Congress really nip. Uh, the SEC in the bud and take away a lot of the power they have to promulgate things like climate disclosures, conflict mineral disclosures, uh, pushing diversity in corporate boardrooms. There's a lot of things the SEC is doing which Congress can change by legislation. I'd love to see them do it as a first uh, step. Well, thank you, Professor uh, Todd Henderson, University of Chicago. Michael J. Marks, Professor of Law. Check out his novels. He's a writer as well as a securities lawyer. Uh, and stick around here on the Hugh Hewitt Radio Program. I'm guest host Kurt Schlechter. We're back with Dave. We're joined by David Drucker, the Washington Examiner, a senior correspondent there and author of In Trump's Shadow. David, welcome to the Hugh Hewitt Radio Program. Good to be here, Hugh. Uh, Kurt. <laughs> <laughs> Kurt! Yeah. I, I don't often get mistaken for Hugh Hewitt. He's a kind, gentle soul, and I'm Kurt Schlichter. So that's... Uh, that's, that's kind it's of like a I'm on autopilot. It's like I'm on autopilot sometimes. Yeah, I sometimes. Knew it was you, and I'm, I'm glad to be here. Well, speaking of pilots, uh, apparently uh, pilots announced on aircraft last night that the uh, mask mandate had been uh, thrown out by a uh, uh, an aggressive judge in the Middle District of Florida uh, to uh, wild cheers and celebrating by everybody except many of your compadres in the media. Uh, what do you uh, and and many other uh, uh, blue check Democrats as well? How do you, how do you think this uh, mask mandate thing plays politically, and is it going to help or hurt the Democrats that they had to be dragged kicking and screaming to uh, pandemic reality? Well, listen, uh, all good questions, and um, you know I, I don't think that the public writ large is going to be upset that the mask mandate has been struck down. You know, the political parties, I mean, everybody loves a, everybody loves a so-called aggressive activist judge as long as they're doing what they want. And, you know, everybody bemoans legislating from the bench when they don't like the legislation. But I, I think, I, I don't think this ultimately affects the political atmosphere all that much, other than to say uh, is that the President Biden has always been, not in the first few months of his presidency, uh, where his leader, the leadership of the pandemic was was pretty well regarded, uh, uh, you know, across the political spectrum. But it, you know, as people have started to become a little less patient with pandemic era restrictions, uh, President Biden has been particularly in a difficult place for this reason: his political base is there's nothing he can do that is aggressive enough in terms of maintaining or furthering pandemic era restrictions and regulations that is good enough for them, for his base. And yet, you know, for many rank and file Democrats, people who voted for him, you know, will still vote for him again. You know, they're vaccinated and they want to be able, them and their kids, they want to be able to get back to a semblance of a normal life, if not a completely normal life. And so for, for independent voters and for many rank-and-file Democrats, you know, things have remained a little bit too restrictive, things have moved too slow, and yet for his base, even, even where he has inched uh, toward normalcy, uh, not only is that not good good enough for them they would prefer that he in a sense double down if you will and push further in the old direction so all of this recovery uh you know should theoretically benefit the president but it it, it never makes his base happy and I, and you know there are lots of things you can say about biden's political predicament that are his fault 
that he caused, that he continues to cause. But this, to my mind, has never been one of them. He's just caught between a rock and a hard place, and I don't even know how you solve that. Well, it couldn't happen to a crustier guy. Let me, let, let's me let move on, David Drucker, uh, to something that happened yesterday. Taylor Lorenz, this uh, uh, obnoxious... Um, <laughs> fake 20 year old i think she's like 39 or something but she pretends to be 25 from the washington post was on tv a little while ago crying because of her ptsd because people were mean to her on twitter and now she's out doxing somebody known as an account known as liberals of tiktok and liberals of tiktok's crime is posting tiktok videos of weirdos losers and mutations with piercings and blue hairs bragging about essentially how they're grooming children and doing other weird things and uh liberals of tiktok wants to be anonymous because the left wants to destroy anybody who fights the regime media now you 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 uh, are among other people in the press you are not uh, necessarily one of the leftists but do the mainstream regime media reporters understand fully how much we hate them when they do things like that? And I don't mean just dislike them. I mean, wish them active ill. I don't know. I mean, there's not that, you know, look, I understand the complaints um, about, you know, the, the mainstream media, so-called, um, even though I consider myself a part of the mainstream media. When I got into journalism after a career, a brief career in sales and marketing. I, I got into it in part because I thought I wanted to do it differently because I saw that things weren't always done the way I would like as a news consumer. But, you know, this sort of thing, you know, doesn't happen all that often. I think the larger story here, what I will say about this is I've always felt, and I mean, look, I like attention as much as anybody, and that's just the truth. Um, one of the things I like about this job is I get a byline and I get to come on the radio Hey, I'm a lawyer. Stuff. I know what you mean. Hey, we only got about 15 um, seconds. But I don't like to be the story. And I think it would be better for all of us if we were not the story, that the people we were writing about remained the story. That is all. Well, David Drucker of the Washington Examiner, you're the author of In Trump Shadow. I think everybody should go out and get that. I wanted to ask you. Should Trump be primaried in 2024 to help him? And we don't have time. We could go on for hours with David Drucker. I'm sure we'll talk to him next week when I guest host on Tuesday. Stick around. We got a lot more to come. The vampire at heart. We thank you, Colonel Kirk. Kirk Schlichter, take it away. Thank you, Hugh Hewitt. I hope that you're enjoying gallivanting across Gaul like Julius Caesar uh, with... Uh, with fewer legionaries. I am Kurt Schlichter, senior columnist at townhall.com, retired United States Army colonel, noted Los Angeles trial lawyer, the author of the forthcoming book from Regnery, We'll Be Back, The Fall and Rise of America, which you can pre-order. And, of course, go get my Kelly Turnbull series of conservative action novels. You can find that all on Amazon. Uh, it's a real pleasure to introduce my next guest. He, you guys know him. You'll love him. He's here every week. Byron York of the Washington Examiner, its chief political consultant and a Fox News contributor. Good morning, Byron. Good morning, Kurt. Good to be here. Okay, Byron, let's jump right into it. Yesterday, age indeterminate adolescent uh, Taylor Lorenz of the Washington Post uh, try has tried to uh, dox the anonymous account known as Libs of TikTok. Libs of TikTok's crime is showing TikTok videos of weirdos, losers, and mutations with blue hair and piercings, uh, in large part talking about how they want to groom children in our schools. Uh, this person, of course, now must be destroyed according to our ruling class. My question to you, uh, Byron York, uh, because you, uh, though are you are not necessarily one of them, you are among the mainstream media, does the mainstream media, the regime media, as it were, understand how much normal people hate them for garbage like this? Uh, no, I don't think so. I listen. Um, this is part, actually, of a you know of a much bigger story, uh, which is the the suppression of um, free speech, free speech and expression on the internet. Um, you know, the Babylon Bee. A uh, very funny website is still off. Their main, their main Twitter account is still off. Uh, Twitter is having been suspended uh, apparently indefinitely until they remove a tweet that uh, Twitter found uh, offensive. And so uh, this is you know this is a small part. You know Taylor Lorenz uh, is kind of a um, kind of a headline seeker. 
um, who has worked at the nation's most prestigious journalistic um, organizations, although I predict that she'll probably get out of those at some point. Well, I, I think Taylor Lorenz is doing incredible damage to the media and, and, and those like her. Uh, I mean, they have zero credibility. I, I don't think that the regime media fully understands how much normal Americans, particularly conservative Americans, actively hate the media. And I use the word hate advisedly. I, I'm not I'm not trying to be hyperbolic. Uh we despise them. We want to cause them harm. We celebrate when a newspaper goes under, and it's all because of what they have done. Well, you know, you you just said earlier that I was part of this, uh, and but not of it, but I not in it. I don't celebrate when when a when a newspaper or a journalistic organization goes under. I you know I just I just don't. I think it's a I think it's a bad idea. You know, I think mockery of something like a person like Taylor Lorenz is entirely appropriate. There's a lot of it on the Internet. Um, so that's, that's as far as I would go with it. You know, I, listen, I think the, the, the question of, of bias just goes so much deeper than the antics of Taylor Lorenz and this whole, this, this whole doxing stuff. I mean, the, the question of bias, I mean, there, there have been people in the conservative movement who've done sort of heroic work uh, against bias uh, for decades, going back yep. to a man named Reed Irvine many years ago. I remember. Bozell and the Media Research Center and, and now Newsbusters have done really great work pointing this out year after year. And they, and they started doing it back in the days when there were three network newscasts, and that was it, ABC, CBS, NBC, and then the Washington Post and the New York Times, which is a vastly worse time, in my opinion, in our media history than today, where you have this just incredible array and, and, and choice of information available to you. To tell you the truth, I think we're in a much better situation today than we were in, say, I don't know, 1965, 1975, when there were those two newspapers, New York Times, Washington Post, three networks, ABC, CBS, NBC, all of them were headquartered within a few blocks of each other in Manhattan, and they all read each other and made the same decisions every day. And you didn't have a choice, and you didn't have the you didn't have access to to um, primary documents. You know, if, if some judge makes a decision, you can now go on the internet and read it, and uh, it, it takes a little extra effort. Um, but you can do that. And like when a, when, a, when a newspaper publishes a story about a poll, I never read the story. I click on the poll and look at the poll. That's something you can do in this media age that you couldn't do in a previous one. So, um, you know, forgive me for being positive here, but I no, think no, I, I, even with, even with the, the, you know, the ridiculous sort of stuff around Taylor Lorenz, we're in a far, far better position than we were, you know, decades ago. Well, uh, Byron York, I, I, I think those are actually very good points. And as angry as we're getting uh, about the uh, repression and attacks on free speech, the Internet has provided us with opportunities to, as you say, reach those primary sources and to uh, and, and there are now avenues for getting uh, around the gatekeepers uh, like the Hugh Hewitt radio program. Let me move on to something that I found uh, both hilarious and deeply, deeply frightening. Uh, a couple things happened in the last two days that I think are very scary. Chris Coons, a very prominent Democrat from Delaware, uh, went on a Sunday morning show and essentially said, you know, the United States ought to intervene in Ukraine. Uh, at the same time, our president was out on the uh, White House lawn attempting to talk to the press and someone dressed as the Easter Bunny came and shooed him away. So we both have a, a, a push among some in the Democratic Party for uh, essentially war with the Soviet Union. At the same time, we have a president who is manifestly in decline. Uh, are, people, are, are people in Washington concerned about the uh, condition of... Uh, uh, of this guy and his uh, ability to be influenced by the short-sighted people around him. Yeah, there's yes. The answer is yes. And and what you're saying, uh, Senator Coons, Chris Coons, the Democratic senator from Delaware, President Biden's home state, 
um, is known to be very close, thought to be the closest Senate ally of the president, uh, was even referred to as a shadow secretary of state in one profile of Yikes. Politico last year. Um, and, you know, before uh, the Russians invaded Ukraine, when they were building up around Ukraine, uh, Kuhn's was strongly against the use of U.S. troops. And what happened uh, in Ukraine, and what, what happened last week, he, went, he gave a speech to the University of Michigan, and he said that we're in a, in a Cuban Missile Crisis hour, and then he kind of mixed his historical references. Then he said we're in a 1939 moment. Each, each time he was, he was saying that we're very, very close Do these people to speak only in cliches? or <laughs> I, I, I mean, there's, it's embarrassing. Yeah, there could be a, a handbook for this. But basically, he says we're going to face a situation very, very soon in which we, we will need to send U.S. troops into Ukraine, oh, and that geez. Putin will only stop if we stop him. So well, basically... Chris Coons has come out in favor of using U.S. troops in Ukraine. And since he is so influential with the president, and then that brings in what you talked about, the president's capabilities at this moment. Um, you know, the, the, the Easter Bunny moment was funny, uh, but it terrifying. was concerning. <laughs> but it was also concerning because uh, of all the other concerns that we've had with um, – with the president's uh, abilities right now, and and I think that you can you can overstate it. You know, there are Republicans or conservatives who during the campaign said, "Oh, he's got dementia and he doesn't even know where he is." Well, he had just participated in eleven Democratic debates in their primary contest, so that was that was crazy. On the other hand, he's going to be eighty uh, later on this year. He's by far the oldest president we've ever had. He's visibly, obviously slowing down. And what you worry about with a president like that, who is slowing down, is that um, ambitious other uh, aides will, are, will be able to, to uh, have room to operate in the absence, in the vacuum created by a president who is not fully able. So that, that is something that's of real concern. Well, it's of real concern to me, and I object to the pronoun we that Coons used. Coons not going to fight in Ukraine. The students at University of Michigan are not going to fight in Ukraine. The troops that I led, they're going to do the fighting in Ukraine, and I'm not buying it, and we're not having it. This is Kurt Schlichter, guest hosting for the great Hugh Hewitt. Schlichter, guest hosting in the Relief Factor studio in beautiful Southern California. You know me as senior columnist for townhall.com, retired United States Army colonel. Um, what else am I? Noted a Los Angeles trial lawyer, author of the upcoming Regnery book. We'll be back, The Fall and Rise of America, which you should go pre-order at Barnes & Noble or Amazon or wherever fine books are purveyed. Got an election coming up. A big one. A big one in which... We are going to take back the United States Senate. Now, it's a pretty safe Republican seat in Oklahoma, but it's the primary that we're concerned with. And I've got a candidate for you. His name is Alex Gray. He's worked uh, in the uh, National Security uh, Council with the what I think is the best national security advisor ever, Robert O'Brien. He's a friend of the show. Alex Gray, welcome to the Hugh Hewitt Radio Program. Hey, good morning, Kurt. Thanks for having me. Well, th thanks for being here. Let's jump right to it. Uh, you uh, you want to join the United States Senate for reasons that escape me. Uh, and you will be uh, in with the likes of Chris Coons, uh, the senator from uh, Delaware, who this uh, weekend said, although he now denies it, essentially, yeah, we've got to inter intervene in Ukraine and fight the Russians with troops on the ground. What the hell yeah. Well, look, it, it's it's insanity. Uh, no one wants to send American men and women to go fight in Ukraine. Well, he does. Um, <laughs> well, well, no, no, no thinking person wants to do that. And unfortunately, I, I think we've got too many unthinking people in Washington and, and in our Congress. But uh, look, look, Kurt, you you know this as well as anyone. We've got a, a crisis in Ukraine that has been caused by, for a large part, by, by the weakness of the Biden administration. They failed to deter what President Trump was able to deter for four years. And you know, we were able, in the administration that I served, 
we were able to do sensible things like provide javelin anti-tank missiles, provide uh, training, and, and all those sorts of things that you do when you're, you're, you have a vested interest in making sure that aggression doesn't stand. But at the same time, President Trump always understood that American interests, while they certainly stood with the Ukrainian people, our interest did not stand with having Americans' boots on the ground or, or anything of that, ma- that nature in Eastern Europe. And, uh, you know, President Trump kept his eye on the ball. And as you know, Kurt, the, the ball, the biggest threat we face is the Communist Party of China. And, and that's where our attention should be focused. And obviously there's a huge connection here between what happens in Eastern Europe, what happens in Ukraine and Taiwan and the Taiwan Strait. But one thing that Xi Jinping is sitting in Beijing hoping we do is get ourselves bogged down in Eastern Europe for decades like we were in the Middle East. To him, that would be the greatest possible strategic victory. And unfortunately, Senator Coons seems inclined to hand that to the CCP. Well, Alex Gray, um, the Republican Party has changed somewhat in the last 20 years. Uh, there, there used to be a stereotype of Republicans as reflexive hawks. Of course, that's very different from the Republicans of the uh, uh, 20s and 30s. But we, we have changed. And I, I, look, I'm not a pacifist. But having served overseas twice, I do understand the importance of making sure that the wars we're involved in and the conflicts that we stick our toes into are ones that support America's national interests. As a senator, hopefully you will be called upon to uh, declare war. Unfortunately, we have uh, not declared war uh, since World War II. Instead, we've kind of had these ad hoc uh, conflicts that always seem to end badly. What is your personal test for when America should commit the lives and treasure of the American people? You know, I think it's it's amazing how in Washington, uh, we, it's obviously war and peace are complicated issues, but somehow folks in Washington think tanks and, and the D.C. establishment have managed to, to turn the question of war and peace into something that I think most Oklahomans can, can give you a pretty straightforward answer to. It's whether this is in the national interest of the United States or not, whether to use force, whether it is in the national security interests of the people of the United States. And you go to any county in Oklahoma, and they can pretty pretty simply give you a straightforward answer. Is it in the national security interests of the United States for us to be engaged in a protracted ground conflict in Ukraine? I think, you know, you go talk to... A uh, hundred people in any county of our any of our seventy seven counties, probably ninety nine, if not all one hundred of them, are going to be able to tell you pretty quickly. No, that's not in our interests. But at the same time, Kurt, we've got a lot of people in Washington who like to create these false dichotomies. They like to say, "Well, you must be an isolationist if you don't want to go and be involved in nation building. If you don't want to go be involved in in protracted conflicts in far far distant parts of the world." It's not that it really doesn't have to be uh, teed up that way. You know, the way I look at it, Kurt, the United States has an interest in peace. We have an interest in preserving the territorial integrity of countries. We have an interest in sending a signal to China that they're not going to be allowed to take over countries like Taiwan without, uh, you know, they're not going to be allowed to change the map of the world by force. That's kind of a key pillar of what makes the modern world work. Um, but that doesn't mean that we have to make investments in building countries, building democracies, the failed policies of the last 30 years. So I, I think a lot of this is our false choices that the D.C. swamp have teed up for us. Well, Alex Gray, uh, running for Senate in the great state of Oklahoma, a great military state. I did my basic training at Fort Sill uh, back in the day, that day being, oh, my gosh, 35 years ago this December. Um, look. Leadership, and I, I, I retired in the United States Army Colonel, re- leadership is about making choices and setting priorities. And not, you know, 
Territorial integrity, very important. I think uh, uh, in Desert Storm, the invasion of uh, uh, Kuwait, was a, it was in America's interest to throw the Ura- Iraqis out of Kuwait. Uh, I was part of Seven Corps that, that did that. I was a small and unimportant part of Seven Corps where I washed trucks, but I, I was there nonetheless. On the other hand, here in Ukraine, yes, uh, the, the Russians have taken Ukrainian territory, I still don't think it's important enough for Americans to intervene. For one thing, I can't think of an end state, and I never hear that from the likes of a Chris Coons. What is the end state? What 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 state are we fighting for at the end? When do we know we've won? And uh, I think it's important important that we articulate those things as a senator. How are you going to help some of the Republicans who, uh, uh, you know, frankly, reflexively go back to the old unthinking hawk ways? Uh, I'd ra- I'd much rather you be a thinking hawk than, than the other kind. How are you going to help them uh, using your experience at the National Security Council to analyze these problems so when called upon to vote? Uh, for war or peace, that they can do it with some uh, uh, skill and clarity. You know, President Trump, Kurt, I think taught us some a lot of important lessons, but one that I think applies pretty pretty usefully to questions of war and peace is uh, is the the maxim that he often said, which was, "Economic security is national security." And one of the ways that the president made decisions about how to use American strength was also in the context of our economic strength. And you know, I, I'm not one of these people that says, you know, that the false dichotomy of we should only be nation building at home, that we should be focused entirely on, on what goes on within our, our coasts. We shouldn't be focused on things that go on abroad. That's a false choice. What happens overseas certainly affects the United States and affects our people. That being said, We've got to ask ourselves, at a time of record inflation, at a time of a slowing economy, uh, at a time of, of, tr- of, of really profound challenges at home that mostly have been brought about by the Biden administration's policies, we have to ask ourselves, what are the fundamental threats and challenges that we're facing? And I would argue right now, Kurt, we, we've got to be thinking about the economy. We've got to be thinking, what are the... the greatest economic challenges that we should be facing. Certainly, it's, it's regaining energy independence. It's not focusing on, uh, you know, it's certainly not putting American boots on the ground in Ukraine. Uh, uh, Alex and, Gray, we only have a few seconds left. How can we help you if we want to uh, uh, get you into the Senate, bring some of that expertise from uh, Donald Trump's very successful National Security Council uh, to our Senate? You can go to my website, alexgrayforsenate.com. We'll be grateful for the, everyone's support. And uh, if you live in Oklahoma, June 28th is our primary. Alex Gray running for Senate. Give him a look. A very, very important article that you guys may have missed. It's in Tablet Magazine. Biden Kosher's Iranian Terror by Michael Doran, a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. I recommend you go read it. And we're joined by Michael Doran now. Michael, thanks for being Thank here you. on the Hugh Hewitt radio program. Good morning. Great to be here. Nice to talk to you in person. I've enjoyed your spirited commentary for a long time now. Well, that's the nicest euphemism that's been used about me in uh, in, in quite some time. No, I I really admire this article, uh, Biden Kosher's Iranian Terror, because I think it uh, uh, brings up uh, their strategy in the Biden administration of trying to cover up what is an atrocious betrayal of our country and of our ally Israel. Can you give us a summation of your uh, thesis? The, the summation of the thesis in one sentence is that there's no Iranian aggression that this administration regards as a national security threat. They only regard it as a public relations challenge. So, you know, when they, the, the Iranians, while they're, while they're negotiating the, the return to the, to the nuclear deal, the Iranians tried to kidnap uh, an Iranian-American journalist in Brooklyn, and they were going to kill her, uh, uh, presumably. Uh, and it barely made the news. It barely made the news. I mean, if you're negotiating with another country and they try to kid, kidnap somebody from your, from your country at that moment, it, that's the time to take a stand. And that's that's one example. I can give you 20. Well, there's another great example right now. Uh, the Iranians are targeting former 
Trump administration officials, including Mike Pompeo and others uh, who, who now need protection. And That's, this is intolerable. I, I don't understand how our government tolerates that, even though they may not be of the same party. Who, who's the enemy, the Iranians or the Republicans? You know, the, 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 the funniest thing about, the, about that story uh, or, or stories is that we, the, the, the Biden administration knew that the, the Iranians had open plots to kill Pompeo, his deputy Brian Hook, and, and John Bolton, all this is for revenge for the killing of Qasem Soleimani, uh, and, uh, and and they continued to negotiate. And at a certain point, information about those plots leaked out to the press. And then the, the press started asking the administration questions, and it, then it got embarrassing for the administration. So then the administration goes to the Iranians and says, hey, uh, we're getting kind of embarrassed with this story that you're going to kill American officials and we're about to hand hundreds of billions of dollars to you. Can you give us a fig leaf? Will you at least commit to us that you'll turn off those plots? And the Iranians said no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, here, look, it, you know, I'm only a, I'm only a retired Army colonel and a Los Angeles trial lawyer who, who does some bit of negotiation. I would have had a different counteroffer, Michael Doran. I would have said, well, uh, you know, you, you can have your plots against us, but you understand if you do any of that, we'll kill everybody you ever met, starting with you. And that, that, perhaps that, that would that, have uh, how, uh, worked a little better. That, that's, uh, that's common sense. Uh, but... This is the thing. Uh, one of the reasons why I wrote the article is that there's a whole body of, uh, of analysis of the Biden administration out there uh, saying that they are bad negotiators. They see that, that they're giving away things during the negotiations. For example, they're not doing anything to enforce the sanctions on the oil sales of the Iranians to China. And so, and so tons of money, even under sanctions right now, is pouring into Iran, thereby releasing them from the pressure to actually negotiate. So uh, a body of analysis says, well, the Biden team, they're really bad negotiators. But I think we need to wake up. They're not negotiating. This is a fire sale. They are, they are in full-blown appeasement mode. And, and it, it, it's bigger than the Iran deal. The Iran deal is the instrument by which they're appeasing, but they're appeasing anyway all the time. Well, Michael Doran, Why? We're, we're in the catbird seat. We have the military power. We have the economic power. We have the diplomatic power. Uh, we have the information power. We should be dictating to these uh, mullahs, uh, who incidentally have already killed many hundreds of Americans in Iraq uh, and, and have not had payback. Uh, why, why are we playing footsies with this guy, these guys at all? I, I don't understand it. There's, there's two reasons. They have a foreign policy theory. And the foreign policy theory is that it's our allies, Israel and Saudi Arabia, that are throwing us into conflict with Iran. That, in objective terms, the United States and Iran don't have that much to quarrel about. And so if we can, if we can restrain the allies and then just start negotiating with the Iranians directly over the heads of the allies, that's the way to stabilize the Middle East. That's their theory. Then, even though not, even though the Abraham Accords have done more to stabilize the Middle East than any other development in the last half century. Totally. I mean, the, the amazing thing with the Abraham Accords is that, that the next step with the Abraham Accords was, was some kind of normalization. I don't know if it was going to be full-blown peace, but it, a, a dramatic public improvement of relations between Saudi Arabia and Israel. Yes. So you've got... Saudi Arabia, the country that all Muslims pray toward five times a day, and is going to make peace with the Jewish state. That has significance for the relations, not just between Jews and Muslims, but between Christians and Muslims, the West and yes. the Middle East, everything. And, and that was within reach because of the Abraham Accords. And the Biden administration turned its back on that and instead decided to empower the worst regime in the region, 
that is aligned with all of the worst elements in the region. It's, well, it, it's insane. Well, Michael Doran, I think it indicates the uh, incredible parochialism of our ruling class. I, you know, I, I'm just a simple suburban soldier guy, uh, but I lived overseas five years uh, and I spent time in the Middle East. I've actually experienced some of this. What what I see with these people, Michael Doran, is this incredible condescension. An incredible misunderstanding. They don't actually think the mullahs believe what the mullahs believe. They're actually disrespecting uh, the Iranians by thinking, well, you know, this this uh, you know apocalyptic uh, uh, Shia nonsense. They don't really believe that. Just like we don't really believe this, uh, you know, religion stuff here. We, you know, we we mouth it at uh, uh, election time. But yeah, you know, we really don't believe it. We're 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 past that. We're secular folks. The the Iranians. I- believe in their faith a, a, a twisted and bizarre version of islam but they believe it nonetheless and these and our garbage ruling class doesn't understand that other people don't think exactly like they do you you kind of have to give it to the iranians here because when they when they when the administration turned to them and said will you at least you know give us a pinky promise that you won't kill our officials they said no they didn't even they didn't even bother to lie, you know. That was there's a little bit of honor in that, I guess. But uh, I I totally agree with you, Kurt, about that. There's there's nothing more parochial than a cosmopolitan American. It's 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 just it's just amazing. They it, and it comes from what you said. It's condescension toward their own toward Americans. That's where it starts because they're in their minds they're always showing themselves in the world that they're more sophisticated than the average American. And it, it's, it's one of the reasons they, they grab this doctrine that's saying that the allies are the problem in the Middle East is because it's, it's, it, it's nonsensical as a foreign policy doctrine, but it's, but it's good domestic politics inside the progressive bubble. Because what it does is it says that all of the bad guys that the, in, in, in the progressive world, the people that the progressives hate anyway, so that's evangelical Christians, uh, 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 re- re- security-minded Republicans like yourself and me, uh, uh, Bibi Netanyahu, Mohammed bin uh, Salman. That's the party of war. Those are the bad guys. They're creating all the problems in the world. And the Iranians, well, they're not the good guys necessarily, but they're the objects of diplomacy. And we, being more sophisticated and more, uh, more cosmopolitan, um, and just more worldly than the rubes in America, we know how to go cut a deal with these nasty bastards over there. That's the way they. That's the way they're thinking. Well, it, it, and it's baffling to me because if you look at the track record of our foreign policy elite, it's a complete disaster. I mean, a total disaster since uh, the Gulf War, which I participated in as a small and insignificant cog washing trucks out in the middle of the Saudi Arabia desert, uh, but. Uh, uh, between the Gulf War and the building of that alliance and the ejection of uh, Saddam Hussein from Kuwait and the Trump administration, that little interregnum uh, of success, it has been nothing but failure after failure after failure. And, you know, and it seems the more that our foreign policy elite fails, uh, particularly in the Middle East, the more arrogant it becomes. It's, it's actually kind of remarkable. Well, we've got an enormous amount of power. Uh, we still have, despite all the mistakes, an enormous amount of power. I mean, that's what the, 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 one of the things that I really appreciated about uh, Donald Trump was that with respect to Iran, I mean, the one thing that Trump understands, it, 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 he, every interaction he's engaged with, he always asks, who's winning? Who's on top, me or the other guy? Yes. And so that's the, that's the way Middle Easterners think. Yes. The, uh, and, and so he, and he looked at Iran and he thought, Iran impoverished third world country the united states superpower uh we don't actually have to take them on their own terms we can we can set that we can set the terms of the, of the debate and so he killed Qasem Soleimani, which was the right thing to do with him it absolutely but, was michael doran your article in tablet magazine biden kosher's uh the iran deal is uh, a, an amazing article tablet magazine michael doran d-o-r-a-n check it out thank you for being on the hugh hewitt radio program we're going to close out with the great liz sheld of american greatness we'll be right back stick around other rocking chicks can only mean one thing 
It's Liz Shell, the editor of American Greatness, who we are attempting to wrangle at just this moment. So she should be with us. And she is with us. Liz, welcome to the Hugo Hello. Radio Program. Hello. Good morning. Very morning for you, right? It's it like is a very early you. morning for me. It is O-Dark 30. Let's get right to it. Taylor Lorenz, the uh, middle-aged adolescent, has uh, tried to dox, and, and actually she's written the article doxing liberals of TikTok for the crime of exposing the emptiness and vapidity of the regime media narrative. What do you think? Well, I, th- I think it's very interesting because wasn't she less than maybe a week or two ago on Twitter complaining about this like cruel doxing environment of social media, and then here she is doing this? I mean, th- you know, is- do you ever get, are, are you like me, and you get tired of pointing out the hypocrisy? I think among us, because we are woke or based, depending on how you wish to use the term, you know, we're so used to this hypocrisy, it's kind of like, ah, more hypocrisy, and only, like, normal people are, like, stunned by it anymore. Yeah, I, I mean, it's exhausting. I don't know why I even bother pointing it out, because it seems like they just, they're not trying to be consistent. But I I noticed when she was complaining that this Libs of TikTok account was misrepresenting um, the stuff she was posting on Twitter, but all she was doing was just posting literally their own videos, entire, you know, unedited. So That's I didn't the crime. know how it was misrepresenting anything. It's just their videos on TikTok. I uh, yeah, and the 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 crime is she's actually showing what these uh, weirdos, losers, and mutations think, and that well, has to so be suppressed. The people that she highlights are proud of what they're saying. They're very proud of it, right? They're on. They're on TikTok. They're not concealing who they are. They seem proud of it. So I guess she's just helping spread it further than just the TikTok world. Why would they? Why would that be a problem? Uh, because right? don't- I, I think at some level, uh, the uh, uh, liberals understand that the weirdos, losers, and mutations with their bizarre colored hair and stupid piercings and uh, grody desire to groom on our children uh, are repellent to normal people, and it must be hidden from them. I think that's, I, and I, I think you had, you know, Taylor Lorenz, again, a middle-aged adolescent. I think she's like 39 she like going on 22. Bobber? I thought she was like a teeny bobber. Yeah, right? she's the, the, the Bobby Sox uh, uh, dowager. Um, I, th- I don't think that she's a journalist. I think she's a janitor. I think her job is to try and clean up uh, the, uh, you know, uh, sidewalk uh, uh, remainders of, uh, uh, of liberalism. The San Francisco sidewalk remainders of liberalism. I think that's her job. Yes, and that's actually the media's, the corporate media's job, because I do think there's a chunk of the on the left where they they are proud of what they're doing. They they do not see that it's in any way strange or abnormal. And then the grown ups, I guess you could say, of the party or the movement know that it is in fact. They need to just they can't say the quiet part out loud, and so that's. I guess what they're doing is going after this poor libs of TikTok. I mean, I just think it's, I think it's terrible. Well, look, I, I, look, I, I, I I asked uh, a couple of our journalist guests, uh, David Drucker and uh, Byron York, both of the Washington Examiner, who are, uh, uh, they, they are, I guess, mainstream journalists, but they're not, you know, liberals. Do mainstream media journalists understand how much we hate them? And I'm, I'm using the word hate uh, very specifically because it's gone beyond annoyance. It's gone beyond anger. Among folks like us, the emotion is hate. We wish bad things upon them. We celebrate when we see a newspaper go under. I see, you know, such and such newspaper closed its doors. 30 journalists are out on the street. I start giggling like a schoolgirl in the Mikado. <laughs> well, now remember, just go back a couple years, or even I think um, at any Trump rally, when Trump would point out the media and everybody would boo and hiss at them, and they would go on Twitter and they would talk about how triggering and traumatic it was to have people like walk by and scream at them or spit on them when Trump was making fun of them. I mean, it just seems like glass houses throw stones. You know, it wouldn't be a good idea to normalize 
like hunting down people whose ideas you don't like. Well, that's that's the thing, Liz uh, Liz Sheld of American Greatness. There are going to be enterprising conservatives, people on our side, who decide to go and dox these liberals. Somebody's going to go out and find Hunter Lorenz's uh, cell phone number, and they're going to post it. And I'm not saying that's right, but I'm also saying I'm not going to devote a second to giving a damn because of well, her. Your rules. You your know, your everybody rules. Follow, everybody follows the rules or nobody follows the rules. Well, you know, look, I, I would prefer different rules, Liz Sheldon of America Greatness. I prefer where we act like adults and we treat each other with respect and we have free speech. But apparently our enemies don't want that. Dude, be careful what you ask for. And I know you're asking for Ed Morrissey to guest host tomorrow. Your wish is granted. And to have me back Thursday, that wish is granted too. I'm Kurt Schlichter. This is the Hugh Hewitt Radio Program. Adam and Ben, thank you guys for your help. I'll see you Thursday.